Hey folks, it's me, Vinny Las Benuso, with my good friend Bill Kale right here, the draft expert himself. Of course, I'm the Hall of Fame expert. And we were we were talking about a recap of the week eleven of Sunday for the NFL season. And um so Bill, I wanted to ask you as someone who, like me, has watched all the games. Um what is your biggest takeaway from uh let's let's start with the bad you know as okay. someone who lives in new york and watches every the the jets and the giants games even though i don't really follow for either and probably the sure. falcons i know um what do you think uh, do you think this is the end for zach wilson well i mean no he's going to finish the season as a starter uh i i think that they this is a strategic benching it, no offense to mr <laughs> mr boyle but he's not a huge upgrade either. I mean, he's he's not a guy that's you. You maybe want to take a look at him, see what you have, that kind of thing. But both these guys are basically uh, seat warmers. I don't know, pick a term. Uh, they they're both going to step aside. They're as both soon NFL. As, they're both NFL players. Yes. <laughs> right, but as soon as Mr. Aaron Charles Rogers is healthy enough to play they will be watching him play. Uh, you know, I, I can't see him playing. I know he's like, I know there's some claims that he's going to be ready to play in December. No, <laughs> no, no way is that happening. I can't see him playing until next season. Well, I mean, even if it were true and I, I don't believe it is either, but to what end uh, they, this is not a team as currently constructed. that's going to make a Super Bowl run. No. So I think the prudent, path at least at this point is to let him get fully healthy we're talking about a man who's 39 years old will be 40 by the time next year rolls around or turns yeah. 40 and more recovery time rather than less recovery time at least to me and i'm once again i'm not you know not a surgeon you know i'm not a physical therapist but i do know what it's like to be 39 and 40 and i know your body reacts to injuries differently when you are in your late 30s and early 40s than when you are in your 20s or even your mid 30s even or early 30s yeah uh so that's one thing I, I guess the thing that the biggest surprise to me was watching mr uh thomas r devito uh, <laughs> yeah he's who, been he was great today he was great so literally you know a couple of weeks ago i was speculating if he was you know, the, the least prepared looking quarterback I'd ever seen in an NFL game. And, and maybe not the least prepared. I mean, I've seen some things in my day, but, you know, shout out to Tommy Hodson, you know, Dan McGuire and a few others. But what I will say is his improvement arc. <laughs> I mean, if he continues on this track, he'll, he'll blow past our friend, Mr. Uh, Mr. Dobbs, if he keeps this up. Uh, I don't. I, I think this is sort of a blip. I don't think this is. You know, if you if you did pick up uh, Mr. Devito and for fantasy purposes, <laughs> <coughs> oh, I like I like how I like how you say fantasy purposes. It works in this context because, like, yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, in superflex and two t uh, two quarterback leagues. Particularly in deep super flex in two quarterback leagues, he, I promise you, there's people who started him. I did in, yeah. in one of my two quarterback leagues a week ago, but I picked up Dorian Thompson Robinson. Now, you know, I rather rue the day because I look back and think, you know, I should have stuck with Devito because he outproduced Dorian Thompson Robinson. Yeah, I, ne I never thought of that. That that's definitely a, that's definitely a conversation. I don't think you expected. You'd rather have Tommy DeVito as your starting quarterback as opposed to Dorian Thompson Robinson. Definitely two quarterbacks people thought about going into the season without a doubt. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah well. <laughs> okay. It was jokes aside. Uh, when it and comes. Hmm? I was going to say the Cleveland Browns sort of out Steelers the Steelers, right? Yeah. The sort of keep it close, keep it close, body punching, body punching, keep it close, body punching, and, you know, win on points at the card. They're the better team with the better roster. And obviously the quarterback situation made them play more like the Steelers, even than the Steelers played. Uh, Miles Garrett, for those who haven't heard, good at football and uh, leads the NFL in sacks and has a shot. You know, I don't think he'll reach 20 necessarily. Well, what do you think about How come P.J. Walker didn't start? 
Uh, two reasons. Well, I say two reasons. One main reason. They really are impressed by Dorian Thompson Robinson, and they want to see what they have in him. And I think P.J. Walker is not in their long-term plans, while the younger and cheaper uh, Dorian Thompson Robinson more likely is in their long-term plans. And I think that they their intent is to, unless he either gets hurt or regresses, is to stick with Dorian Thompson Robinson for the rest of the time that Mr. Derek Deshaun Watson is unable to play. Mm -hmm. How are you doing, Zenny? What a game. (laughs) Oh, my God. I am just – that was a good old-fashioned – who was it that used the term slobber knocker? Lots of people, but – Who originated that term, Bill? originated i mean it goes back to probably the 20s or something or the teens it's a very old term um i remember seeing it in print you know from the gratlin rice and and you know days jim ross jim ross said it thank you the age of the internet rules (laughs) i'm pretty sure it was around before Jim Ross. Uh, I've, well, I've he, heard he said it a lot, though. No. He said it a lot, but I've heard it long before Jim. I ever heard of Jim Ross. But uh, to the point, <laughs> yeah, I love this. Song. If <laughs> if Cortland Sutton got the AJ Brown treatment, we'd look at him differently. He is an extremely talented wide receiver. Yep. and he's battled injuries at times, but he's healthy this year. He is number two in the league in in re- receiving touchdowns. And he's doing it very efficiently. He doesn't get a lot of targets. Uh, frankly, they should target him more. And if they were, you know, and all over the field, you know, not just red zone, not just deep, they should move him around, put him in the slot, mm-hmm. bring him out of the backfield. But he's the kind of guy that, with his combination of size, speed, athletic ability, strong hands, toughness, run after catch. He could be a superstar in this league. I absolutely loved him coming out of SMU. He was my wide receiver, too, uh, that draft year. And I think that we're still – we still haven't seen the best of Cortland Sutton. Uh, but I'm hoping that they realize what they have and that they start to sort of feed him the ball more and more. So what did you guys think – Oh, bless you. Bless you. And then Bill, I mean, just open ended. What did you think of the co- the contest uh, tonight? I thought that it showed a matchup between two teams that had a lot on their plate. The Vikings, even though from all intents and purposes, are way more likely to make the playoffs, they know that if they were to win this game, they'd be a lot closer to the division rival Lions when it comes to potentially winning the division. Yeah, and with the Broncos. I mean, the AFC is very, very, very competitive. Um, like, just like two or three wins separates the Browns, who are the top wild card team, and you know the Texans, Steelers from like all the way to like the Jets, who will have who have four wins. So that's a whole like nine teams, like nine, ten teams competing for three spots. And the Broncos knew that they need to win four in a row to get to five hundred. And the Vikings knew they had to win seven in a row, not seven more, six in a row, to really get their way to seven wins. And like the NFC is a, a, a bit softer than the AFC, but the top teams in the NFC really kind of move away from the pack from the than 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 the bad teams. And then just seeing this game, Vikings had it earlier, but just turnovers cost them often, fumbles, interceptions. And for the Broncos, it's it's not like they were really that great in terms of you know scoring in the first place. They they oftentimes settled for field goals. They were more conservative with their play calling. It wasn't until the very very end of the game where they relied on short plays and amazing hands from Cortland Sutton to win the game for the Denver Broncos. And that was the game. It was a defensive stru- um, grudge match, in especially in that second half. The second half really defined how that game was. Well, by the way, if you were betting on this game through Bet MGM money line, you took the Broncos. You are and one forty five. You won point spread. Minnesota Vikings. You had the Vikings. Gave two and a half. You won. Uh, 
And total points, if you had the Bron Broncos, you won. Uh, and so that's, you know, there that is. Bill, what do you think? Yeah, well, another thing that isn't, I think, discussed enough is the role that Samaj P. Ryan played. Oh, and yeah, he, was good. he is, yeah, he is uh, something of a specialist. And I remember watching him in Oklahoma and thinking his body and the way he plays do not always match up, right? He's something like 238 pounds or 233 pounds, or something like that. He plays in the in the 230 plus pound range. Uh, but he's not used like a power back at all. He's used as if he were a, and he is a third down back. I mean, most of those guys are between about 188 and 205 pounds, but he looks, you know, like a very different kind of back, but he has really soft hands. He really understands uh, blitz pickup. But one of the craftiest and most interesting plays he made was one where he stepped up into the hole as if he were going to pick up a blitzing linebacker and slip past him, right? Uh, and made a nifty little catch after, yeah, yeah, after sort of deking yeah, really the, fast. It was like, what? yeah. So he has a certain amount of football IQ to go with, uh, you know, a certain amount of ability. And what I like about Samaj Piran is he knows how to get what's there. And then realize, you know, I got to get down or I got to get about because they were obviously they had more time. They, I think they were acting as if they had less time than they had. Uh, yeah, they were. Yeah, especially yeah. having yeah. made time. There's was a ton of time. Actually, uh, right. a minute twenty at first. I'm sorry. You're yeah. Right. So, so the the uh, the Broncos actually left the, in my opinion, left the Vikings too much time. They they actually moved a little too quickly. Obviously, you take a touchdown when you can get it, but. They were, you know, going out of bounds and taking timeouts and things like that when they didn't need to. They could have let the clock run more and given uh, the Vikings even less time to work with. But Samaj Piran was sort of a quiet hero of this game. And then obviously a loud hero of this game was Jaquan McMillan, who has really helped to settle down that defensive secondary. And once again, another guy that people sort of looked down on in the, the pre-draft process because of his uh, physical size and you know, level of competition or whatever it is that people talk about. But he was a guy that I really did like coming out. And he, when he came in and when um, uh, Fabian Moreau came in, the secondary began to come together. Uh, so it was a, and this is a guy, once again, was an undrafted free agent, you know, uh, not highly regarded coming out of East Carolina. And he has truly put it together uh, in his really limited playing time. But in that limited playing time, he's, he's shown me a great deal. And I think that, you know, the, the arrow is still pointed up on Mr. Jaquan McMillan. Moreau has been around a little longer, so he sort of is what he's going to be. But I, I'm a big fan of Jaquan McMillan. And uh, like I said, a lot of people thought that, the Broncos were packing it in when they got rid of some of the people they got rid of. You know, they moved on from some people, uh, some of whom they just flat out cut, uh, you know, like Frank Clark and um, who was the other pass rusher they just put on the streets. But yeah, two. Mr. Grubb. I just remember. Um, oh, uh, uh, Gregory. 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 Yeah. Gregory. 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 Yeah, yeah. They traded yeah. to the Niners. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Gregory was traded in and. Frank Clark, which is outright released. And some people thought that was a sign that they were, you know, waving the white flag, but no, it was a cultural uh, decision. They wanted to, you know, I guess to sort of paraphrase uh, Mike Tomlin, right? We, we, we want volunteers, not hostages. So they moved on. <laughs> well, what is that? Can you explain that? What does that sure. mean? He's talking about people who come because they want to come, not because they're under contract, right? Uh, because the money is good, you mean? Well, it's not just, no, I mean, there are guys who, who do exactly what their contract demands of them, right? Okay. It says I have to be here at this time mm -hmm. because my contract says I have to. I have to do this because my contract says, says that. He wants guys that are showing up because there's no other place they'd rather be. Because they and, care. And because this is what they want to do. Like, they really love doing this. You know, they love they, football. They, they love football. They love, love, football. They love the wants... grind. They love preparing for football. They love watching tape. They love lifting weights. Uh, getting treatment, all that. Uh, but one thing about going with younger, hungrier, and frankly, less expensive players 
uh, is it gives you certain opportunities. And once again, when you do sign a quarterback to a, a contract of a certain level, it constricts what you can do with the other parts of your lineup. So some of what they did was, so some of it money driven. Those guys are going to fall off by June 1st or before June 1st, in some cases of the next uh, contract year or next uh, NFL uh, league uh, calendar year. And now that'll open up space for some other players. Obviously they're going to draft new players like you do every year, but also they may have a little bit of money, not a lot, but a little bit to play with free agency to shore up their offensive line and some other weaknesses. But you could see uh, Zinni, Zinni likes to talk about game planning and things like that. There were some halftime adjustments made because the Vikings were really hurting them with some things in the first half of the game. The Broncos were struggling with some of their, you know, Brian Flores is king of the blitz. Mm-hmm. Uh, they blitz. And yeah, Brian Flores found his inner buddy, Ryan. Yes. Well, I mean, only more so. I mean, he's closer. <laughs> he's closer to his inner Jerry Glanville, right? The last time I saw a team blitz as much as this was the old Grits yeah, blitz, blitz in Atlanta. Blitz, yeah. yeah, the yeah. old Grits blitz in Atlanta. The he 70s, was blitzing. Yeah. Right. He was blitzing darn near three, three, three out of every five downs. Except, and, you know, the reason why I say Buddy Ryan as opposed to Glanville, because Glanville wasn't as crafty in his scheme. He would just blitz you. He didn't have somebody pulling back, right? He did. It was like one of those foolers, like the Rams threw, threw at the larger stall back on the Dallas Cowboys uh, for the um, 1978 NFL. L divisional playoff game. So, you know, uh, it was different. The reason why I remember that is because Roger was consistently talking about how he was worried about the Rams who were actually going to do, they were going to fake the blitz and then pull it back. And uh, that's what Flores people did. And I was really, I don't know if you guys thought, I was thought, but I thought regardless of the outcome, it was one of Coach Flores' better performances as a defensive coordinator. What do you guys think? Well, both oh, defensive coordinators. Yeah, and Jan Van Joseph too. Yeah, I was absolutely. gonna say both defensive coordinators. I mean, there was a couple times they got burned, but for the most part, the defenses, to use a hockey term, stood on their heads. Uh, yeah. They 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 both made a lot of terrific plays. They they were you know diving into passing lanes and tipping balls. They were punching balls out of receivers and running backs' hands, getting pressure. Not always getting those. Both those guys are really good athletes. They didn't always get them on the ground, but they made them reset sometimes reset twice in a couple of cases, but because they're, they are athletes and they're good at getting passes off on the, on the run, you know, a couple of big plays that Dobbs got were off of pressures. In fact, mm-hmm. his, he was, when he was pressured, uh, it, it, this is obviously not true later in the game, but early in the game, he was four of six um, and, it, and it was making big plays off of pressure. Uh, the big play to Hawkinson and a few others all came over times when he was pressured, but but it came down the stretch and the game was on the line. They were getting to him. And that's where his unfamiliarity with certain things did catch up with him a little bit because he didn't know, you know, the scramble rules and things like that. Uh, you don't know who's going to do exactly what at what rate, what guy's going to go deep, what guy's going to come back to you and things like that. You establish that just through reps, quite frankly. Uh, so, Yet you could see he didn't have as many reps in some of those situations. You know, he hasn't been in that many, you know, uh, you practice probably a couple of times a week, your, you know, one minute offense and things like that. And he's only been on the team, you know, literally just a handful of days, a little over a handful of days now, but not that many days. So he's probably had four to six live ish, um, live, live ish practices working on those, you know, sub two minute offense kind of situations, but you could see that both teams had given a lot of thought to how this game would likely play out. Both teams thought this would be a close game as I, as I also thought it would be. And little things become big things in games like this. So hugely, don't you think? Sure. Definitely. Yeah, if you like, if you get a good return off a punt or a kickoff, that stands that's large and something like this. Uh, you know, a key penalty, right? A penalty that takes you out of uh, touchdown and pushes to a field goal, or, or takes you from field goal range to punting in a game that's going to be decided by, like, so many games by one possession. In this case, you know, almost less, almost less than one possession. Uh, you can't afford to make those big mistakes or little mistakes that become big. 
And the last thing that stood out to me was, as I said, they really were having a lot of success uh, in stopping the run early on. And eventually Denver, they didn't so much, I won't say they entirely gave up on it, but instead of, they used their little dump off game and they used, you know, those check downs essentially as runs. And once that happened, particularly once again, Samaj Piran was gashing them. So they knew that the one thing that was not a strength of at least some of the linebackers was actually covering backs out of the backfield. You know, Singleton's not bad at it, but it's not the best part of his game. And Barrett Brown, Baron Browning is essentially an undersized pass rusher who is athletic, but doesn't have a great sense sometimes of where to put himself in space. So they took advantage. Um, the Vikings took advantage sometimes of the Denver linebackers like Ty Chandler did. And then they returned the favor to the um, uh, they did. I mean, hey, right, it's well, funny, though. You have to well, admit it's funny. Mm -hmm. Well, that's yeah. that one of the old sayings in well, in life as well as in football is what makes you laugh and make you cry. So you look at what you know, you're being victimized by something. See how they like a taste of their own medicine. And <laughs> and Samaj Pirine, though, he's not became an explosive player that that Ty Chandler is. He did. Like I said, he did hurt them. In those little short passing game late in the game, it set up that that final score uh, for the Vikings. And now, what does it say that the Broncos start off one and five, and now they're five and five? Well, See, how, you, that that's climbing out of the cellar, Vinny. What do you? What does that say for the Broncos? Oh, yeah. def oh, Just definitely. Your, your opinion? That's you know trying to. Oh, I would abs absolutely like because you look at the Broncos' season so far. Like, they're four wins in a row. And these weren't, like, you know, oh, like a bad team here. No, no. You look at the wins that the Broncos have had. You have – I'm pulling up I'm pulling up their schedule right here. You have, okay, a game against the Packers. Okay. The next week, they really handed to the Chiefs. Okay, division rival, first time they won, like, after, like, what, 16 matchups? Yep. And then their bye week. The following week on Monday Night Football, thanks to I would say it's more of a Bills loss than a Broncos win, but still they got it done against, like the Chiefs, a team many think is a playoff team. And then following week on Sunday Night Football against the Minnesota Vikings, you come back and win against them. Another, and I gotta say, like if the only reason why I don't know if they are going to be a playoff team is because. The AFC, especially their wild card race, is very, very tough. And you look at their upcoming schedule. Next week, you're against the Browns. You're hosting them, which, okay, they can go either way because their defense is quality. Then afterwards, you're against the Texans in Houston. Then you're against the Chargers in L.A. Then week 15, that's probably going to be a Saturday game against the Lions in Detroit. Then you have the Christmas Eve night game, assuming they don't flex it against the Patriots, which feels like a win. And then the next week, uh, you host the Chargers. And the following week, the final game of the season, you're against the Raiders in Las Vegas. So this feels like a team that I could I could see them winning against the Patriots and maybe against the Raiders. Chargers, I could see a split. You I see the Broncos see beating the Raiders? Wait, no. They Well, they lost to the Raiders in the, earlier in the season, I could see them splitting the series, but considering it's in Vegas, anything could happen. I could yeah. see this team go winning like because the Raiders almost beat the Miami Dolphins. You realize that, right? Oh, oh, I know. I'm saying that because it's a division of game that can go either way. I yeah. said I could see like maybe they could win like they, they have like a seven and ten team or a nine mm -hmm. and eight team. Like this is a team that I think if they do make the playoffs, they'll be like a seven seeded team. But if they are a seven seed. Hey, that could be an interesting matchup for the Ravens. Maybe the Chiefs are against them. The Dolphins again. Like there, there are some interesting matchups for the Broncos. But the reason why I'm kind of skeptical about crowning them as a potential playoff team is because you look at the three teams that are current wild card spots. The the Browns. Mm -hmm. The Browns have a really really good defense. Texans. They're playing. Lights out football. Even though they kind of fought with the Cardinals, I still think they're a legit playoff team. The real question comes with the Steelers, who, even though they're six and four, I mean, based on I think like you know yardage, they have been 
but negative in the league with that. But they're still in close games at the very worst. Yep. And even then, I still think the Steelers' defense, they'll just do enough just to get over that hump. So, And you also have the Bills there, but the Broncos have the tiebreaker against them, so I wouldn't worry about them too much. So they feel like a team that if they make the playoffs, would be a 7C, but more likely they feel like they're a team that might just barely miss out because of how just how strong the AFC is. What do you think? Uh, Bill, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think – they have a shot to be a nine and eight team. They nine could, and eight, I could that, say. that could that could definitely happen. I, I think that they're going to be, you know, a game or two in wonder right over that. Either they're going to be nine and eight or eight and nine. I don't see them being much worse than that. I mean, worst case scenario, maybe seven, ten. And if everything goes possibly right, they might get to ten and seven. But they get ten and seven, I think they can make the playoffs. Right. I mean, 10 and 7 is, if you're trying to make playoffs, is probably the target you should have, especially in the AFC. You know, obviously there's some teams in the NFC that are going to be right around 500, maybe in the, maybe in the AF, uh, the NFC South, maybe in a game under 500 might be enough to <laughs> yeah. put, put you in. But yeah, I, you could see this team coming together, starting to figure each other out. We talked earlier, very much earlier, obviously, about the initial sort of prickliness and friction as coach Peyton tried to put his stamp on the franchise and it took a while. Uh, part of it is getting rid of some people. We talked about that. Mm -hmm. Part of it is people figuring out who he is. He's kind of a, uh, he plays mind games to a certain extent. Uh, and you know, he comes off the Dwayne AKA Bill Parcells uh, tree and he's picked up some things from, from Miss uh, coach Parcells, but the initial sort of personality clashes and things like that have either resulted in people coming to understand each better or getting rid of some of, the, some of the other players. So this is now, it's not his team, you know, as much as he'd like it to be, but it's much more his team than when Coach Payton first came I don't in. know why I ever give some credit for uh, picking up anything from Jim Fossil. That's a good I question. Mean, I'm, I'm sure people I mean, have I given him. No. But then, I think I think there's like fossil like when it comes to the Giants coaches. That's what I think of because that's the, where I discovered that he. Sorry, I'm sorry, Vinny. Go ahead. What were you saying? The issue with the Giants as someone who lives in the area. Yeah. Um. You have the Super Bowl teams of Jim of Bill Parcells and Tom Coughlin, and you have a couple like you know you have you know Dan Reeves, but sandwiched in between that is the Jim Fossil led Giants team that went to that Super Bowl where they got I blown mean. out by the Ravens and you know around here it's not really mentioned at all almost like you almost forget that even happened because it's so scantily talked about I understand they lost and it was a blowout loss but yep. still like I, I, you almost forget that the Giants were even in that Super Bowl because it's never mentioned here and I think because of that Fossil himself isn't really mentioned that, that's just my perspective who is someone who's around here I, I as for why he isn't mentioned more with Fossil? I'm not sure. I mean, he was the offensive coordinator when Fossil was the coach. It's kind of question. I, I question that. Now well, you're a piece, Mr. Jim Fossil, by the way. I, I, I'm going to get this in before we get too far because I want to offer what I think about the Broncos' future during the schedule. I, I think that the the real contest which will psychologically decide their future is coming up against the Broncos and the Browns, excuse me. Oh yeah. Next if, week. Yeah. If they beat, if they beat the Browns with that defense, then I believe it's 50, 50. They could beat the Texans. Definite. They could beat the chargers, even in, in LA. I mean, it's it's it, the, it's never a home field advantage over there. <laughs> right. Even, and the lions, Going to Lions Den, I can't see them winning, but I'm not going to put it outside the realm of possibility. The the Patriots, I think the Broncos win that one, and the rematch against the Chargers, I think the Broncos could could quite possibly take that outright. I believe they would lose it to the Raiders. So if we start, you know, looking at that, let's say that right now they're five and five. Okay, so they yeah. beat the Browns, they're six and five. That's like major psychological edge. They go Definitely. in. To Houston, if they beat the Houston, if they beat the Texans there, they're there staring at seven and five. And oh, brother, we're really talking about something. Oh yeah, like okay. if they beat the Browns, that's one thing. But if they manage to take that momentum and beat the Texans the following right. week, watch right. out. Those right. Broncos 
are riding. Right. Now, let's say. I would. Let's, I would, you know, hold I would. On a second. I'm, not, I'm not done. I'm not done. Let's say, because that's seven and five, all right? Let's say mm -hmm. they go into L.A. and they lose to the Chargers because I think the Chargers are a faster team, all right? Mm -hmm. So now we're looking at seven and six. Lions looking at seven and seven, all right? Broncos beat the Patriots easy. So now we're back to eight and seven, right? Mm -hmm. Chargers and Broncos, they get a rematch. Broncos figure out what they did, you know, that they shouldn't have done before. So now instead of eight and seven, we're at nine and seven. And finally, the Raiders, they lose, so we're at nine and eight. So there goes there, there you go, Bill. That puts some meat on the bones, right? Well, that, that, eight, that, that works, actually. That, that, yeah. that works. I can, yeah. see like a, I can see like a nine and eight Broncos team like around that area. But we talk about the Broncos. What about the Vikings? Like that's another question because even though I see the Vikings as a probable playoff team, there's no guarantee that's going to happen. Now, granted, you look at the NFC playoff picture – um, the wild card teams have six or seven wins, and everyone below them has four or less. So there's a two win gap between like the Seahawks and Vikings, and then like the the pool of the Packers, Rams, Falcons, Buccaneers, and Commanders. Um, now looking at the Viking schedule because I don't want to forget them either. You have the against the Bears on Monday Night Football uh, next Monday. And then you're on a on your bye week, so they have a very late bye. And then they go against the Raiders in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. The next week they're going to be against the Bengals on Saturday in Cincinnati. And then this is like a real big stretch: Christmas Eve at one o'clock, hosting the Lions. The Ooh. next week against the Packers, hosting them potentially a Sunday football unless that gets flexed. And then finally, week 18, a game that could potentially be flexed the prime time in Detroit against the Lions. Now that's that's a tough stretch coming up because okay, Bears you could beat, but that's seven and five. Raiders, let's say they find a way to beat them. That's eight and five. Bengals, you know, that can go either way because even though they don't have Joe Burrow. You know, their defense could still maybe shock them. So let's say I can't. I can't see the Bengals beating them. I'm yeah, sorry. I, I can't. I just, let, let, let's say that's like I don't know. Let, let's say that's a eight and six, and then okay. you have the you have the Lions. You could ho host them. I, I think they're going to split it. So I'd say that's like nine and six. And the Packers, I think you'd host them. So ten and six, and then against the Lions in Detroit, ten and seven. So a ten and seven. Minnesota Vikings team that I think should be in the playoffs. Yeah. Like yeah. that, that like Josh Dobbs, he, he is so good. <laughs> and now Grant, he made a couple mistakes, but it's just so fun to watch him play. Like, especially with his story and everything to see that he would just scramble and run and find a way to make like near first downs happen was just unbelievable. So uh, here's a question though. All right, so if they get that far, what does that say for the Saints are at, are the top seed right now? Oh, with, with the Saints? You mean you mean the Eagles? This, I mean, well, the, the Saints are the top, not the top okay. seed. See, but I'm talking about the top in the, the South. Oh yeah, right. because but I'm just I'm just curious to play this out because that is a that is a weird team and Saints. Yeah, I'm saying it's weird. I'm looking at the games coming up because their car is coming off concussion. Does anybody know? Definitively, how he is? No, I have. I, I have not. Bill, really do you have any idea? I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna all the her. all the reports have been positive of how he's responding, but you know, he hasn't been cleared officially yeah. to, to play. Yeah, that's what I'm getting. Okay, he hasn't been cleared. Now, think of the, the work with me on this for for guy for a moment, guys. Okay, look, think about this. All right, you got a guy who uh, he started out injured his shoulder and his passing arm, right? Yeah, it turned out to be you know. Relatively benign compared to what it was originally thought by folks like me, like, oh, he's done for the season. All right. That yeah. didn't happen. All right. So then the next game, he he hurts his I mean twice. Actually, the next the two oh. games after that, remember how he started hurting his groin, but yes. no one talked about it? Mm -hmm. and it looked like he had a stomach flu or some sort of some sort of I don't know what was going on with his abdomen where he was grimacing in pain and going down like that. Mm -hmm. All right. And now we've got this situation. So my point is, what is going on with Derek Carr? Because if 
if Derek goes out and Jameis Winston comes in, there are people who think that gives the Saints a better shot. But let's just go with Derek Carr coming back, and let's just evaluate the Saints from that perspective. I mean, are they are they? Would you bet on them in Las Vegas, Bill, or not? I mean, they're still the best team in the AF. I mean, the NFC South. So yes, I mean. They, you said that hesitantly. You didn't say that like, yeah, they're the best. <laughs> you know, because I, I mean, don't do because I don't do that. But but there's no better team in. The, I mean, look at the roster. Like they just have a better team than everyone else. I I will say when it comes to the Saints, like on paper, I'd say that's the case. But you look at also their schedule. Okay, you have Week Twelve. Oh, they're at their bye week this week. So next week they're going to be against the Falcons in Atlanta. Um, I feel like the Falcons will win that. So that's five and six. Against the Lions. Oh, wait, you think the Falcons? Wait, wait, wait. Stop the presses. You think the Falcons are going to beat the Saints? I'm ca- I'm all. just I'm lying with you. Of no, course. No, no, I'm, I'm just asking. I'm just asking. Um, I mean, it's I okay was, to have an opinion. That's the whole idea. I was I thinking that right? I was thinking that the Falcons would split, but I also know you that you can beat them badly or a little bit. Just barely beat them. <laughs> just wow. barely beat them. Okay, I'm going to shut up now. I want to hear the rest of this. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay, then I see the Lions. Could, I mean, they're hosting the Lions. That's a game that I could see getting flexed. Lions are really good. Granted, they did come back against the Bears, and Goff looked pretty shaky today. But I still feel the Lions are a better team, so that would be 5-7. and seven. Against the Panthers, okay, win, that's easy. <laughs> that's an easy win. Um, no offense to the Panthers, but you just suck. 6-7. Um, and seven. Um, then against the Giants, seven and seven against the Rams. Ooh, that's a tough one. Uh, that feels like a coin flip. Um, I'd say, um, yeah, that's six, almost a trap game. Six and eight, maybe because the Rams are home. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Buccaneers, that's a tough one against them. They're hosting them. I know the Buccaneers are hosting them, yeah. but the Saints have the Bucks number. So, like, I don't know. Like, the thing is, the Falcons, I see a win. So, this is a team that I feel like can go like eight and nine, nine and eight, like somewhere around there. Like, they just barely win the division if they do it. And I think when they win the division, if they do, they're going to face against a Cowboys team that's going to destroy them in the first round. I feel no, no offense to the Saints, it's just that you know the Cowboys are a better team. But then you look at the Bucs. Let me ask Benny, do you think if Carr mm-hmm. goes down for whatever reason and Jameis Winston finishes out, out the season, they have a better chance of going to the playoffs and going I to think, the playoffs? I think with his skill set, they are more likely to be a nine and eight team compared to an eight and nine team. Okay. Um, as for the Buccaneers, who they they lost against the Niners, but I still feel like they are. Com- I think it's them and the Saints for that division. Um, Panthers are obviously not good this year, and the Falcons have a lot of issues. Um, Buccaneers next week are against the Colts, which can go either way. I go the right now four and six. They can go like the Colts are pretty competitive too. Like. Maybe four and seven, maybe I don't know. The Panthers, five and seven, Falcons, six and seven, Packers in Lambeau, six and eight, maybe. Um, then against the Saints, they lose. Like, I think at the end of the season, they'll be like eight and nine, just barely miss out in the playoffs, eight, nine, seven, and ten around there. Yeah, and (laughs) Bill, what I just want to highlight something real quick. You mentioned something about the Dolphins, as if the Dolphins are some great shakes. The Dolphins <laughs> have only – the Dolphins, you probably know this, have only one win against a team that's even 500, and that team just became 500. That's the difference. Right, right. The, uh, you know, I'm glad you said that, Bill, because this was but, – but see, I was thinking about this from the flip side. I thought this was a barometer game for the Raiders, okay? And I, and, and I understand that – you know, I'm trying, I was trying to figure out how to place the Raiders in it and that they lost. So I thought, okay, well, have the Raiders meet, met their ceiling, right? And let's face it, I understand about the records. And look, you can keep saying, oh, they only play as well or better than teams that are at 500 or maybe a hair or, or hair below or above. 
Oh, but way look, below. Most of them, are, most of the teams they've beaten were bad teams. I mean, we well below five hundred. As we go through the schedule, okay, they're going to face more teams that did well toward the start, right? Just after the start, the first four or five games out of the season that are now on that bubbled area because they faltered a loss. So my point is, at what point do you call a weak team a weak team? And at what point do you really call a strong team a strong team? And I'm, I'm glad you asked that. So, because yeah. this is why I, I, I really, I went back and, and watched Miami's games again. They had, a, of course, started off the year with a fantastic game, a great game, one of the best games of the whole season against the Chargers, 36-34. It's an exciting game. Everyone's talking about it still, or at least people who watched it. And then it's more of a ho-hum affair against uh, the Patriots. The Patriots, even in their greatly reduced state, still do a great job of taking away the things that you most want to do. They took away – you know, Tyreek's ability to make big plays. They slowed down, you know, a lot of their quick strike passing and things like that. And then, of course, the game that put everyone on notice, the 70-20 game, right, uh, versus a very different version of the Denver Broncos. This version of the Denver Broncos would have given them a very different game than, than the Denver Broncos they faced. Then they get blown out by the Bills, right, 48-20. Uh, mm -hmm. Then they blow out a very bad Giants team, 31-16. Then they blow out a terrible Panthers team, 42-21. Then they lose 31-17 to to the Eagles. Then they beat the uh, Patriots again, and a little, little more breathing space this time, 31-17. Then they lose a tight one to the Chiefs, and the Chiefs could have beaten them by many more points, but they played a very sloppy game. Uh, the Chiefs didn't look like themselves, but still managed to get the win. And then, as we just pointed out, they just won 20-13 over the Raiders. And the Raiders, I will say, have raised their level of competition, but they haven't raised their level of talent. So they're they're playing harder, they're playing smarter than they have in the past, but they still don't have the players. You know, they, they have one true mismatch player on offense, and that's Devontae Adams. That's a guy that makes you – Def, you know, defend him differently than you defend other players at the position. Right. That's it. That's the only mismatch player they have on offense. And then they have one mismatch player on defense. His name is Max Double X Crosby. That's the list. You don't think Hunter Renfro is a mismatch player? Teams don't spend the defensive coordinator isn't staying up till three o'clock in the morning the night before trying to take away Hunter Renfro's any. Yeah, but could it be that it's because the offensive coordinator isn't giving the defensive coordinator reasons? You know, to be concerned about him, un, un, unlike when John Gruden was the coach of the Raiders and R John Gruden was giving defensive coordinators reasons to be concerned about Hunter Renfro. Sure. So what you're talking about is the potentiality of him being a mismatch player, but he's currently I'm not. about how they're misusing him. Right. But I'm saying currently he is not. He, yeah, he's I'm not misusing <laughs> I mean, you're, putting, you're proving my point. That's all I'm saying. We're proving each other's point. My point is yeah. that nobody worries about Hunter Renfro. He barely plays. Right, and yet I'm saying if the Raiders discover Hunter Renfro. That would be nice if they rediscovered Hunter Renfro. Yes, it looked like they're about to the last game against the Dolphins. He had a heck of a pickup. And then they didn't. But hopefully they will. <laughs> I mean, if what's the old saying? If 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 if, if was a fifth, we'd all be drunk. But uh assuming you drink. But the whole point <laughs> But but oh to this God. point, Zinni, it has not happened <laughs> in this season, at least. I, I, I have a feeling it will happen. What, what do you oh. think? What do you think? It looks like Vinny's about to bust a gut. Oh, wait, I, I was going to say wants a fifth. Yeah. You know, actually, I wanted to mention actually. I want to mention with another game that happened that I think is very important for the playoffs. Um, the Rams come came back and won against their division rival Seattle Seahawks, yeah. and there's some rumors about like how is Geno Smith's triceps going to be mm -hmm. um right. is was it torn or like what, what what happened i don't it's not torn but i don't think it's torn because he, he played a little bit um after but you could tell he's he's clearly not 100 mm -hmm. yeah like because you look at the seahawks upcoming well, hospital, let me check here what's going on look at the seahawks schedule it's rough um you're against the niners on yep. thanksgiving yep. then next week you're against the cowboys on thursday 
Then the following week, you're against the Niners again, this time in San Francisco or Santa Clara, more specifically. Right. Then you host the Eagles. And then, then you next in the following week on Christmas Eve, you host the Titans. Then the Finally, next week, you host the, 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 you host the Steelers. And then you fi- finish it off by going against the Cardinals in Arizona. So, but that loss, like they could have been in seven and three. Now they're six and four. Okay, that's a loss. So, like, I feel like they can go like one and three during that. So what that would be seven and seven. Like they, they, they could potentially be, and then against the Titans, because it's a win eight and seven Steelers. This is what that'd be like nine and eight now, like nine and eight, 10 and seven, eight and they, nine. Right. They could go, they could go. I mean, 10 and seven would be, I think the, the absolute ceiling of what they could get to. And it would take some things going the way, some things would have to <laughs> go their way. You know, maybe, one of the teams they're playing has a key injury. I mean, things happen. All kinds of things can happen. Uh, like they have a key injury, right? Or key injuries. Uh, but yeah, he, they he came out. Uh, Drew Locke came in and you know, surprise, surprise, threw a, an interception. But uh, they put a big old brace on it. You know, you could tell they were working on it a little bit. He came back in and, and played a little bit, but you know, all the passes were very short and didn't have much on them. And I, I'm assuming, and once again with absolutely no knowledge or information that it was more a pain management and maybe even a, a loss of strength and situation as opposed to a, I mean, it would be, I was going to say malpractice. I, I guess it would literally be malpractice to put a player out there who could conceivably make the injury worse. So you, especially if it's a starting quarterback. Hey, so I, happen, I happen to find this on Seattle sports by Brandon Gustafson. It reads the Seattle Seahawks, had a shot to take a lead, late lead Sunday in Los Angeles, but Jason Myers' 55-yard field goal attempt went wide right and came out short, resulting in a 17-6 loss to the Rams. Yep. The Rams had gone ahead with just a thir- one minute and 31 to go on a field goal on their ro- of their own. A late drive with a chance to win it was always going to get attention for the Seahawks, but that was especially the case be- due to the situation at quarterback. Starter... Geno Smith took a big hit late in the third quarter and missed nearly three full drives where the Seahawks did next to nothing offensively. You know, Smith was deemed questionable to return with an elbow injury, but he was able to play the final drive. Smith quickly zipped the first down pass to Tyler Lockett and a few plays later found DK Metcalf over the middle of the field for a first down that put the Seahawks in the field goal range. What happened next though was interesting and didn't work out for Seattle. The Seahawks were out of timeouts, and rather than attempt the pass play with 24 seconds left and try to make it a shorter field goal, Seattle handed off to rookie running back Zach Charbonnet for a run that picked up just two yards. That yep. was yeah, I, I was watching that. They, I think they were trying once what again. They're trying to burn clock, which I didn't think they needed to do. They, once again, they were afraid of giving the ball back well, with time on the clock to the uh, to the Rams, and they were a little too concerned. And Zach Charbonnet is a is a fine young running back. Uh, but he's not even their starter, as was just pointed out. So my question is, how Walker. much is really on Pete Carroll's play calling as opposed to – because Gino came in and you know finished the game. Yeah, I don't think Pete Carroll is the offensive play caller. But, uh, Whoever it is, you know. Yeah, it's their offensive coordinator. But um, the I, I was not a fan of what they were doing there. Yes, I think that they, they got a little too conservative. And Jason Meyer had been having a good day and a good season, in fact. Uh, and you know, solid fantasy pickup for those who uh, who, are, who partake. Shane Walsh uh, is the offense. This is the, yes. The yeah, court. I'm, I'm very years. familiar. Very familiar with that. Yes, he's been there for a while. Uh, he was a and he was a quarterbacks coach even before Shane Waldrop got promoted to being coordinator. But uh, yeah, he's been he's been with the pro, uh, the program the uh, first franchise. the The issue is that he is, now. I will say that uh, I think. Coach Carroll has a strong uh, philosophical influence on the play call. Like I still, I feel, I think people know what he wants, if, if you know what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. But, and he is, you know, mostly conservative in the way that he's, you know, like most defensive minded coaches. And then he's probably still thinking back that one time he decided to, you know, get fancy with things, you know, ended up being picked off by Malcolm Butler. So people still get on him to this day about it. So he's, in his heart of hearts, like so many defensive-minded coaches, he's, he's a more conservative man 
Now he's loosened up in some ways, but especially for a man of his age. But the the fact that they had the opportunity to pick up, you know, probably six to eight yards with a little dump, even just a little dump off. If they wanted to get a sharp hands, they could have done it through the you know through the passing game, and made it a much more makeable field goal. And Jason Myers does have a strong leg. He has, I think, his career long is fifty eight or fifty nine or something like that. So he's got a strong leg. But yeah, that was not an ideal situation uh, to put it all on him from fifty five yards. Mm-hmm. So, Benny, go ahead. Yeah, right. I was also going to say for the Rams, I'm looking at their schedule. It's beatable, actually, um, against the Cardinals. Um, that can go either way. I'd probably say five and six. Hey, Benny, you can put the schedule up and let us look at it. You know? Oh, okay. You have I'll that just, ability. Yeah. Okay, I'll just do that. Just pull up on the page. Well, Vinny be nimble. Vinny be quick. Vinny be Here he is. Now. Schedule stick. There we go. Yes. Um, okay, four and six against the Cardinals. Mm-hmm. I can go like maybe four and seven, four, five. I'm going to say five and six. Hey, can, hey, buddy, can you enlarge that a little bit? Uh, sure. Okay. Okay, let's see if I can like make this a bit bigger. Is this good? Yeah. Okay, so four and six, and then this would be, I'd say that's a win, so five and six. That can be six and six, or it could be five and seven, I could see. Ravens, I think that's a loss, so... Maybe five and eight, six and eight, seven and eight, hmm. eight and eight. They, they could finish as like a six or Wait, eight. You're telling me that they're going to go off on a four game win streak? No, I don't think they will. <laughs> I, I I think they're going to win. Maybe win or Did a you loss. Did you hear that, Bill? I don't think he said four games. I think no, he I, said, I, I think he said he thought they could win four the Arizona games. Game. Four games. I counted four games. Not in a row. Right, but, but not in a row, no. He said the Arizona game was a possible win. He thought they could possibly beat the Commanders. Um, the, Giants. the Giants. Yes. That's four. But, it's not in a, but, they're, but they're not consecutive. The losses are, I'll tell you, Cleveland, right? That's a loss. Okay. He also said that the um, Ravens uh, forty, uh, the Ravens and 49ers. All right. Yeah. So basically you're thinking that. All right. Okay. I, think they, I think they could win three in a row yeah, here. Yeah, but I, I can't see four in a row. Interesting. Um, uh, I think, I th- but granted, I don't think Stafford played that great of a game. Um, I think it didn't help that Cup looks injured again. Yeah, Looking he's, at, he's um, injured, yeah. yeah. What, what's with Stafford? Is is he kind of like he's not? It doesn't seem as accurate. I, well, it's, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Bill. Well, it's two things. I still think he's not 100 percent physically, but I think the other thing is his offensive line isn't as good as it once was. Uh, he's also and he's not as old as some of the quarterbacks we've talked about who are older, but he's not a young quarterback. And when he was younger, he took quite a pounding, right? Oh, yeah, he remember did. watching him in his days in Detroit. And at some point you say to yourself, especially if you're on a team that you don't think is, you know, a Super Bowl team, things like that, you say to yourself, I, I don't need to hang in here and keep taking all these hits. So he's a little protecting himself a little and, you know, maybe fading away uh, as opposed to, hanging in there and taking some of those shots. That's part of it. Whenever Cooper Cup's not available, he doesn't look as accurate also. That's his, you know, whatever term we use. Security like blanket. A security is, blanket. Is, yeah, that's a term that we use a lot. Yeah, Because Touch of that, stone. like the health of Stafford and Cup is going to be key to this because yep. I think if Cup and Stafford are, remain healthy, this is a team that I could honestly see winning, like, in total, I could see this as, like, a nine-win team potentially at, at, at maximum. But if not, this is a team that could think could finish like six and eleven, seven and ten. I think the Rams' main problem to me, okay, mm-hmm. is that this year they don't use play action as not enough. And while I don't have statistics to back it, this is anecdotal. I remember that when they had a really great stable of running backs, and well. As Bill pointed out, they were younger. Uh, play action, and remember the uh, bootleg action that they really popularized of a, t- of a style. Yeah, I don't. That's gone from the Rams. That's gone from the Rams' approach. It's like, it, for whatever reason, 
this year, and it's not like it's not used in the NFL. I mean, look at the Vikings and Josh Job, Josh Dobbs, right? Look at the Falcons and 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 and, and uh, how they use their offense for Desmond Ritter. Thank you. Or and, even, they, even that one is kind of even if I may, or even when they brought in Taylor Heineke. Okay, they were still mm-hmm. running uh, that bootleg fashion that uh, Dave Rangone. Uh, Fang f- and his boss Arthur Smith favor right. <laughs> so um, I get that right, Bill. So hey, Ragone, yes, Ragone. The, pride of, the pride of the Louisville uh, Cardinals, where he once was a record-setting quarterback. And the, so, um, and so my point is though that the Rams have gotten away from the type of run action passes that worked for them. Why I don't know, and I love to ask Sean McVay. What's going on? And what his thinking is, you know, because yeah. I I haven't I haven't seen much of it at all. Yeah, I've noticed I, they didn't really do that much, which is kind of weird. But also, I don't I I think maybe they're relying a little bit too much in the passing game. But you know, it just feels like in general the accuracy has definitely gone down. Also, I want to talk about another game here: the Browns Steelers game. Another very key divisional matchup that decides playoffs because at the moment the browns are the five seed and the steelers have the six seed hmm. steelers were winning games despite uh being losing in the yardage battle but they got the win and that's what matters at the end of the day but they lost a close one to the browns their offense still didn't look great um next week they're against the Bengals, so even without joe burrow i don't know, like I feel like they'd win against the Bengals, honestly. Mm-hmm. It's like seven and four. Cardinals, I don't know. It feels like they always lose like teams that they should win. So let's say let's say seven and five. Patriots, um, they've had eight and five. Uh Colts, I can go either way. I'd say like hmm, nine and nine and five, eight and six. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Bengals, I think they'll beat them both times. Um Look at their nine wins here. Seahawks mm-hmm. lose, so nine and seven. Ravens nine and eight. I could see them as like another nine and eight kind of a team. Maybe ten and seven could be just good enough to just sneak in as like a seven seed potentially. As for the Browns, seven and three start, looking really really good. Um, but next week against the Broncos, I feel they're going to lose that one seven to four. Against the Rams, I think they'd win um, eight and four. Jaguars eight and five. Hmm. Bears nine and five. Texans, ooh. Um, what the heck happened to the Bears, man? Nine and six. Then the Jets. Thing that's happened for the last couple of years. Are you new? <laughs> ten and six, and then the Bengals ten and seven. I think this will be a ten and seven team that'll make the playoffs. Time for a new head coach, boy. That was just plain awful. Yeah, I, mean, I didn't see the whole game, but I just, I mean, look it. Look it. Look it, okay? Um, give Justin Fields a lot of credit. Uh, game against the Lions, he is 16. He is almost 70. You realize almost 70% of his passes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. QB rating of 105.2, one touchdown, no interceptions. He outplayed he Goff. He outplayed yeah. Jerry Goff. Can't blame the loss on him. No. All right. It's all his his Eberflus's defense. The way he plays the linebacker so far back, they might as well be in Alpha Centauri. And he leaves these bubble areas that are larger than mansions. And he lets running backs run through them like, you know, they're on their way to get chow at Thanksgiving. I mean, this is absolutely ridiculous. It is. It, like, Eberflus, I, I could be wrong. Like, I'm looking at... Eberflus, um, Eberflus, I am not effusive about uh, this coach. It's driving me crazy. I, I, I As a Chicagoan born in Chicago, I want something done about this guy. I want the mafia involved. I want... Anyway. Well, well, okay. well. Well, Zenny, here's a little fun fact for you about um, the Chicago Bears. They have never fired a coach in the middle of the season. I'm aware of that. I'm aware of that. 
I'm, I'm you know, I'm, they've been I'm around for over a century and it may I, take a I long don't, time. Look, but I, things I'm painfully aware of that, but the hey, come the end, come time of the end of the season, all right? Tick tock, tick out. That's all I'm saying. Oh, I, I, I honestly, I think they could fire. I think I would not be shocked if they fire him before the season ends. And I, I would not be shocked. Like, to, 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 hmm? oh, just just to briefly answer where the Rams are in terms of play action percentage. Now, in the last three games, they're down to fifty five point two three, but they're fifty eight point five seven percent on the year, which is just above the middle line. They're number fifteen in the league in use of play action passing. The, what's different is their effectiveness, right? That's what's different. It's not, it's not really so much how much, it's how effective. Well, but, but, but Bill, hold on. Well, time out. Time out. What I'm saying is that they did more of it before. I'm not talking about where they are at now with respect to the league. I'm talking about what they did that popular that made them win and also that popularized a then new style of approach, okay? That's well, what I'm talking about. I'm saying that they were 61.4. You know, I mean, it's it's a it's a. You're right. They're down a little, but it's not right. a, the num. The, it's not a dramatic difference. The, the difference is not so much the number of attempts on play action. It's the effectiveness. They don't have the same effectiveness they once had because they don't do the same kind of play action. And the other thing that's different, of course, they don't run the ball as well as they used to. Um, they are checking in. Right now, at uh, number nineteen, I think. Uh, so they are not running the ball as no, sorry, not even that. They're is that right? Hold on. But they're running the ball as often or as well, and they're not as effective when they yeah nine. Sorry, eighteen. They're number eighteen, four point one yards a carry. Uh, so they're number eighteen in the league in rush yards and uh, rushing yards per attempt. And when they were at their peak, they were they were about four point four, and like I said, they were about sixty one point four percent play action at their peak. But the like I said, they're not getting as many big plays off of play action. That's the the big difference. They are not getting big plays off of play action than what once they were. So and, effectiveness is the big big difference. And not only that, let me see something here. Do, 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 do. Uh, 2021. Okay. Passing play percentages, Rams. 59.31. In the last three, they went up to more than that. Yeah. And in 2019, which was their Super Bowl year, I believe, they were, aha, they threw more. Uh, 61.99, 61.99, but that it, but that also includes play action. Right, but the play action percentage wasn't... Okay, so that's... For 2019? Before. Check that. For 2019? Check that. I, I, already, I already gave you it. 61.4, but was play action passing. Um, the, the, the main thing was different was the yards off play action passing. It's come down by about 2.7 yards per play action pass. That's the big difference. They're not getting big plays. Well, here's They're Rams. Getting- well, hold on a second. Here's he'll here. This will settle this because here is Ra- it's Rams wire says Sean McVay explains Rams shift in play action usage of this season, which means I was right. And this was October 21, 2021. And play action passes were a staple of Sean McVay's offense when Jared Goff was the quarterback for Los Angeles Rams. McVay used play action this season, use of a play action this season has declined, and there's no other logical reason as to why besides the arrival of Matt Stafford. Uh, following a question about calling play action passes this season, McVay iterated why the Rams are us- utilizing fewer of those plays in their offense this season. Quote, I think it's really predicated on which phases of our offense we do we want to try to utilize to attack the opposing defense. We could sit here and really talk about the depths of that for a really long period of time. Play action is part of our offense as the keeper game, Big Vic said. The drop, the drop back game you're seeing a little bit more of, but there's different phases of the drop back game. Are you talking empty? Are we in six-man protection? There are a lot of different phases of our offense. I think what you're talking about is you want to be as multiple as you can, presenting a variety of looks that the defense has to prepare for. But 
You also want to be smart when you're utilizing some of those things that might be that might put a little more stress on the offensive line and some of those known passing situations. Interesting. It's a give and take, but we've done a lot more out of the shotgun like we talked about. The timing of this question, that's the quote. That's McVeigh's comment. They didn't put a quote at the end of it. Now, the author writes, the timing of this question is not by coincidence as Los Angeles will host the Detroit Lions in week seven. This is 2021. Goff is now the starting quarterback of the Lions, and he will get an opportunity to face his former team on Sunday. In previous seasons, when Goff was under center, the Rams were always near or at the top of the league in play action rate. Hear that? From 2017 mm-hmm. to 2020, Los Angeles ran play action on 32% of their dropbacks, which was the most in the NFL per Nets Gen stats. Uh, it has been quite different this season as Stafford is ranked. So really the bottom line is it really has to do with the change at quarterback uh, as much as anything else. But also it may very well be um, a, a, a part part and parcel of the I word, offensive line injuries. Yeah, they've had a bunch of offensive line injuries. And of course the retirement of Andrew Whitworth, a bunch of th- – their offensive line is not what it was. But we're still talking about a difference. We're still having a difference of less than 3%, though, is what my point is making. Which mm, but I look at it that differently because, that look, that, that less than 3% could translate into whether or not you call a play-action fake on third and one and a key, key, key part of a game, all right? Because, I mean, think about it, Bill. You're talking about a percentage, but how many NFL contests have been decided by one play, okay? And so – Lots of them, yeah. I rest my case. So if you are known, you're making your bread and butter as as was Bill Walsh initially with the San Francisco 49ers his first two championship years or the years where they were winning uh, starting 81, 82, going, all right, good, okay. You, he was known for, if it was third and one, he was lining up brown formation, but quite likely play action fake to the fullback Montana takes one, two, three steps back quick, throws to either Freddie Solomon or John Taylor at split in, and generally gets a stick, all right? That that was almost textbook, okay? But again, that's that's part of the foreigner's ID then. But if you look at the total percentage, it's small. That's all I'm saying, but it's significant. Yeah. Same with the Rams. Or That's Bill Ring or uh, Earl Cooper or sometimes, even, like that sometimes even famous yeah. Amos Lawrence. Right, exactly, so, precisely, yeah. That's all I'm saying. Well, all and, I'm saying. well I, I don't think it's a phil- – the point I was making, I don't think it's a philosophical shift. I think it's a personnel shift is what I was trying to say. See, that's, what I'm, that's where I love to talk to Coach McVeigh yeah. because, you know, I, and you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can get that interview because I interviewed him once before – and then Joanna, for some particular reason, cut me off. I know why Joanna cut me off because she was on a time crunch. Uh, and I was getting to that. And I was like, you, Joanna! Uh, uh, Joanna used to work the NFL. Now she's a PR rep for the Rams. But anyway, um, that would be a fascinating discussion to put to rest because they really had an innovative approach to mm-hmm, play. They did. And you know, to just lay it rest there, I think, is a waste of uh, a good football conversation and nothing else. <laughs> You know, so I didn't mean to make everybody so quiet. All right. So having said all of that and the fact that it's now an hour into my hour and eight minutes, we're going to wrap up at some point soon. Mm -hmm. What's on tap for. And when do you want to do our Thanksgiving preview? I'd say that uh, it'd be good to do the Thanksgiving preview probably at time like maybe like Thursday, maybe Wednesday night, potentially. What say you, Bill? Well, I'm not available Wednesday nights because I do a Wednesday night show and have for several um, years. <laughs> but I can maybe, do maybe two, maybe a Tuesday night. Maybe I can do either earlier on Wednesday, um, you know, like, more like more like evening Ooh. as opposed to night. Okay. Uh, or I can do Thursday morning, you know, early. Uh, Thursday morning, Thursday morning will be busy for me because I'm gonna be cooking a lot of stuff. Not not Thursday morning, not Thanksgiving. No, no, Thanksgiving will be very busy for me. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't be adverse to doing something in the evening, though. Short, but my but Thanksgiving morning, 
yeah. the Thanksgiving period, I can't do because I'm going to be busy with family. Yeah. So, look, why not? Uh, t- you said Tuesday, Bill, could work for you? Uh, Tuesday is fine. Yeah, I could do anything pretty much any time on Tuesday. As, Tuesday night, I could do. As the Fonz go, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bill looks sleepy. Wake up, Bill. I'm yeah. very much awake. I'm a, just, I feel I've, little... just been, I've just been awake a very long time. I've been awake since 3.40 something this morning. I feel... I feel ah, wait, wait, wait. Are we going to this church? Bible study? What's up? Writing. I write. <laughs> For those who haven't heard, I'm a writer. <laughs> what are you writing? You haven't written it down as any 62, so I'm like, you know, where is he at? What are you doing? You know? Um, you know, some of it's fantasy football stuff. Some of it's, you know, a lot of different things. But yeah, um, you know, some historical stuff. But yeah, I've got articles and whatnot. Yeah, you should bring us. We have zennyreport.com. It's on Google News um, and uh, actually works really well. Technically, folks, if you're watching, you got to watch zennyreport.com. You got to check it out. Uh, it is our best technically operating uh, site there is and uh, quite proud of uh, its operation. And uh, and everybody here, yourself, Vinny, everybody's got a account all there already. Bill, you, you've got a couple of articles up there already. And uh, there's a comment system. People can read, leave their comments. It's spam proof. Uh, and and it's, 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 it's really, uh, I'm, I'm quite proud of it. I don't know how many times I can say that. But uh, I'll, I'll say it, you know. So, so having said all that, it's right here before we shift gears to another conversation. So you wonder what it looks like. It's there. And you would say, why did I call it Zinni Report Ego? Well, not exactly. I'll, I'll explain this for those uh, who are curious. I, I called it Zinni Report because have you ever heard of Zinni Optical? Uh Yes, I have heard of Zenny Optical because the Bulls advertise them. Yeah. yeah. Well, also the guy who started Zenny Optical uh, lives in Piedmont, up just about a mile away from me in Oakland, and he and his wife admitting admitted taking and using my name as the basis for their then new Zenny Optical, and then squatting on me on using my name. Okay, squatting, you buying uh, ads through Google to basically. Uh, get attention drawn to their glasses and their company uh, through my name, and so I thought, you know, I I, I thought I goose them, and I thought, okay, fine, I'll I'll make Zinni Report, and I'll make something as close to Zinni Optical as possible to basically start, you know, interrupting their search to a degree since they won't hire us as a sponsor. And I'm talking about this directly because this is important, folks. Um, although I'm not going to belabor or take over this conversation t- uh, to this point, but Black media has a hard time getting sponsors. So we have somebody literally stealing your name, admitting it to you. Wife is admitting it to you and then yet won't put their ads and pay for the ads to have it on your platform. All right. That's in my word, my way of looking at things is criminal. All right. So that's why I created Zinni Report. And it did work for a time because if you type owner Zinni Optical, guess whose face came up? Mine. <laughs> Yeah, actually, I'm not, yeah. not okay. gonna lie. When I saw Zenny Optical, I said, like, "Does Zenny own an, an eyeglass place too?" No, Maybe. they've been doing this since 2003, man. Mm-hmm. This is awful stuff. So, you know, folks, all right. As as much as society has improved when it comes to we building media organizations and everything else, uh, as much as proud as I am of Brian Byron Allen and others. And I'll get to that later, and I want to belabor the point, but I'll just I'll just answer with a um, with with a a um, a response that is akin to the man who ran for president of the Democratic Party, Howard, whose last name I just forgot. He went on, yeah, okay. So there it is. There's like yeah. Does anybody remember his name? You call it Howard um, um, Dean? Is that what you're talking? About? Howard Dean. Howard Dean. Yeah, yeah. That's my Howard. Yeah. They, they've driven me to Howard Dean levels of nutcasery, folks. Yeah. Just, you know, stuff, right? uh, so we will we will crack that code one day, but that's how Zenny Report came to be. Uh, and I would love everybody to use it and you know help me continue conquering and overcoming this racism against media and making everybody rich in the process, including my shareholders. 
boom, boom, boom. All right. So, folks, all right. Now, shifting gears to another question I have, which is more burning than anything else, and that is this. Who's going to win the Super Bowl? Uh, I have I have the Panthers defeating the Patriots. <laughs> okay, okay, just joking there. Uh, got it. Um, no, I just want to know how that hurt. I want to know how that happens. Uh, well, the way it would happen in the first place is that all the other teams that are running for the walk would have to just bottom out completely, and the Panthers would have to get really, really good or just barely sneak in and winning it. Everyone else in the division would have to do bad, and the Panthers would have to win out and essentially get there. The Patriots, they would need everyone else to literally just be terrible, and the Patriots have to win every single one of their games just to make the playoffs, and they would have to then win out in the playoffs, probably on the road in all instances, and then they'd meet in the Super Bowl for a Panthers-Patriots Super Bowl, a rematch of Super Bowl. 38 okay well in all in all seriousness um i think it's going to be a rematch of last year's super bowl i know it's a very safe prediction to predict the to predict chiefs eagles again but it feels like this year with all the uncertainty i would not be shocked that the game tomorrow is not only a rematch of last year's super bowl but a preview for this year's Super Bowl as well. And I believe this time it will probably finish. I don't know. I, I think I think it would finish. You with do the Broncos beat the Chiefs, right? What? No, 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 no. I I I said I, I no, I said the Eagles and the Chiefs. I know, I but know. I said you do know the Broncos beat the Chiefs. The point I'm making yes, is I do. How do I'm yeah. trying to cognitively leap. From that, <laughs> I don't know. Well, uh, I, but, you, sure but you, but you, but you, but remember, the distributive property doesn't work in football because you could also say this is the Broncos got beat seventy to twenty by the Dolphins who aren't that good. So, and guess what? The Dolphins couldn't beat the Chiefs, so it doesn't work that way. It's it's like it's like it's, it's like boxing, right? Just because I beat this fighter doesn't mean I can beat the fighter that this fighter beat, right? <laughs> Sometimes the matchup matters more than the record or whatever. Like, I well, that's what right, but that's that's precisely what I'm getting at, though. All right, but from a different way. Arguably, the Broncos provided the schematic approach that others would adopt to beat the Chiefs. That's my that's my hypothesis going forward, and I'm dying to see how it plays out defensively as we go forward. Here's another question I have when it comes to uh, – we're going to talk more about tomorrow's game tomorrow. but uh, Wait, We didn't get to Bill's uh, – Bill. Oh, Bill, Bill, you speak. Bill has a choice. Yeah, well, I think I, – I said before the season began, I thought the Eagles were the best team and, and they would win the Super Bowl. He did I, haven't moved, I haven't moved off of that. I still think the Eagles are the best team in the, in the league and they're going to win the Super Bowl. Uh – I mean, will it be the Chiefs there again is the better question, right? Um, I mean, the Chiefs have been underwhelming at times, but they usually find a way to win games they really, really, really need to win. They'll probably find a way to win a lot of these games. I'm trying to think of who could conceivably remove them from the uh, from the chessboard. You know, a lot of people talked about the Bills, and I knew the Bills weren't going to be that good this year. And then a lot of people talked about the Bengals, and I knew the Bengals. The Bengals lost a lot of players, uh, not a lot, but they lost significant players. If I were to put it in the off season, yeah, due to the their salary cap situation, I just don't see another team. As much as I'm not that impressed by the Chiefs, I'm having trouble finding another team that I think will will take them out. In the uh, in the AFC, I mean. The, the only other team that I truly, truly scares me when I think, you know, in terms the of Dolphins, you don't think the Dolphins could take out the Chiefs? I, the Dolphins don't impress me at all. Uh, but the Ravens, however, who are the only team that's top five in offense yeah. and defense, is the only team that I think would have a legitimate chance. But no, the, I'm not impressed by the Dolphins. So let's, let's talk about the Ravens then, because we haven't. Mm -hmm. 
why not the Ravens as a Super Bowl? Oh, the Ravens could. That's that's a, that's what I'm just saying. That's exactly okay. what I'm saying. That's the one team I could see. They make it definitive. I just was like, yeah, I, I think it's gonna be a Ravens Chiefs AFC Championship game, and I think the NFC right. Championship game is gonna be a rematch of last year's Niners Eagles. So there's a potential chance that we get a rematch of, we could potentially get a Super Bowl. 47 rematch from that we can get a super bowl 54 rematch from that we can get a super bowl 57 rematch from that or we can get a brand new rematch of ravens eagles hmm. all are possibilities but yes i think the ravens are the you only see the cowboys at all no no i think the cowboys i get, I get like when i look at the top four teams in the the nfc to smash people you know oh yeah like the way i see it the, but smashing the, people doesn't mean that you're going to be good teams when you have to it doesn't, <laughs> not, it doesn't mean you're not either that's true. right but but there's no, something because no, because look we're talking about let's let's argue about this we're talking oh, about okay we're, no seriously we're talking no, about week 11 all right uh, yeah. and i've i've calculated back when Dan Quinn was coaching the Falcons that after the sixth game, everybody's got a book on each other and they refine it. Okay. So now we're at that point where arguably a number of teams have significantly altered their approaches for different reasons, injuries, data analysis, and so on. All right. So it's fair to say that the Dallas Cowboys of now are vastly different than the Cal Dallas Cowboys of the start of the season sure. and better. And they're playing that way. That's all I'm saying. I think oh. the Cowboys are a team. I'd say the way I'd rank the NFC teams, Eagles are one, Niners are two, Cowboys are three, Lions are four, then the rest of the field. I, I think I, – I personally feel that with the Dallas Cowboys, they are a team that I think is – Definitely in the mix for sure. The reason as to why I have the Eagles and the Niners as opposed to them or the Lions is because even though the Lions have looked really good this year for the most parts, I do question about their inexperience. I do question about, you know, maybe some not so great plays here and there. And the reason why not the Cowboys is because. If they face up against the Eagles in Philadelphia, I'm not really sure if they're going to beat them. And against the Niners, the Niners have their number in every instance for the most part. That's the reason why. If now, if hypothetically, you have the Lions or the Niners get upset in the wild card round, it happens. It could happen. I, I think now I do think the Cowboys could beat the Lions. I, I think that is definitely possible. If they match up against the Lions in Detroit, I think the Cowboys can definitely beat them. And I think we could get a real scenario where we get a Cowboys-Eagles NFC Championship game. Can you imagine the ratings for this? This is by far the most <laughs> common Sunday night football matchup throughout its history. It's happened 16 times. And the year that it did not happen, the two years that it did not happen, 2008, you had a Monday night football game that made up with back-to-back -back games in 2009 with one that was a playoff game. And in, 20, in 2021, I believe, they had two Monday night football games. They flexed one. for two. So th these two are always on prime time, it seems like. These two absolutely hate each other. So I think there I think if it's in that circumstances, I would not be shocked that the Cowboys win against the, the Eagles if it's at the NFC Championship game. I don't know if they will, but it would not shock me. But if they do, man, a Ravens Cowboys Super Bowl matchup would be really That'd be an interesting game. Be because fun. yeah, really, yeah. really fun. Because because I'm, the I'm reason about that match. The reason the Cowboys have struggled, you mentioned two teams, right? You mentioned the 49ers and the Eagles. Mm -hmm. What yeah, are those, those two what do those two teams have in common, everybody? They both beat the Cowboys. Right. But I mean, besides that, what do they have in like obviously that they have in common? Oh. They have... You said both the Cowboys and the No, no, no. I said the, the two Eagles teams and the 49ers. The, the, you mentioned two teams the Cowboys have struggled the last couple of years against in the forty well, in case the 49ers, you can go back further, but we're talking about the recent version of the Cowboys. They've struggled against those two teams, the 49ers and the Eagles, and for the same reason, right? Mm -hmm. 
powerful defense. Probably that too, but look at what they do on offense. Both of them have dominant run games, and they push the Cowboys around. So hmm. that offensive line gets movement. Both those offensive lines get movement on the Cowboys' defensive lines every single time they face them. And the Cowboys' defense is so predicated on getting you in third and six, third and eight, third and seven, third and nine, third and 11. But that doesn't happen that much. You're, they get third and three, third and two, third and one. And guess what? Look at the third down percentage of conversion against everybody else that they face. And then look against those two teams. Those two teams are converting at 59, 62, 67% against them because it's third and one, third and two. And that's always been, at least recently, the kryptonite for their on defense. Yeah, yeah, the, the, is it the Cowboys? If if it's not that the Cowboys are a bad team, it's just that these two teams are their kryptonite. The, the cow the Cowboys, the Cowboys are a legit team. Like they are a legit, sure. like yeah. championship contender. Yeah, and that's why I say that this version of them will solve that problem. That's again, that's hypothesis. Oh yeah, like I, I think this. The I will. Team's I great. will wait to see them not have Jordan Mailata push them around, and then I will believe your hypothesis. But until I see that happen, until I see Trent Williams and Jordan Mailata not throw guys out of the club, I'm still going to believe those guys. Are but you know, they can overcome the that. They could borrow. They could borrow elements of what Brian Flores is doing, which is really great to beat that kind of um, blocking style, and you know, get your running back tossed out of the out of the club, as you like to put it. Um, they could they easily do that. Dan Quinn could decide to have a have a have a a flashback moment to what he used to do defensively and say, "Hey, I think I'll try that again," um, because it's, it works. You know, well, well, we'll get to see him on Thanksgiving against the Commanders, which it's been a lot of times. Like, I'm actually looking at the we're talking about more. I, for the am end. I am I the only one disappointed in Eric Bieniemy's performance this time? I don't, I don't think it's Bieniemy that's the issue. I mean, okay. their offense is moving the ball. They're racking up yards. Yeah, it's not Sam Howell oftentimes has been like the top three or even top the number one in terms of passing yardage. Yeah, what, passing attempts and passing yards. But that's yeah, the problem. Right. Like they they're throwing the ball too much, quite frankly. But they hmm. they but they're racking up yards. Like nobody, I mean, I'm watching the Commanders games. I don't know if you are, but they're moving the ball like nobody's business. Well, the, admittedly, that's. I'm glad you said that because I don't have. The uh, uh, the Sunday ticket. You have Sunday ticket. I I, I have all the games. Yes. So I have all the games. are you using are you using here's, Sunday? Ticket? Here's 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 what I've noticed yes. when I watch. No, but, 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 yes. 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 Okay. So here's, okay. but, here's what I'm going to ask you. How you all liked it? That's all. Oh yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's amazing. Um, but <laughs> it always I mean, has let's been. Go ahead and buy it then. All right. Uh, yeah, I've had it since since the early days. Since um uh, uh what was it my since. My birthday of 2000 and God, what year was it that um, they put what's his name from the Browns on the Peyton Hillis? What year was they put the Peyton, Peyton Hillis, Hillis on the on the um, on the Madden cover? That was an inch. That was definitely a year. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever year that was, I've had Sunny tickets. 2012. Okay, okay. I've had Sun. I've had Sunny tickets since then. Um, yeah, Derek Anderson came out in that first game of the season, lit people up. It was like, what's going on? How is this possible? Yeah, that happened in but, 2007. Derek Anderson, that was Oh, cool. <laughs> okay. So I've had it since. But Peyton Hillis wasn't on the cover then. Peyton Hillis wasn't on the cover until like Madden 12. That late? Okay, well, whatever. Yeah, so 2007. Late. So I've had it since 2007. Then that sounds more like it. But here's the point I'm making. If, if, if you watch them, um, now they've got some problems. Like Charles Leno is – you know, starting and they've got a lot of players out there that are players that probably should be swing tackles or probably are starting tackles. They used to have Brendan Scherf out there and they had a very effective running game. And they, I mean, they, the talent level on the offensive line has gone down. That's one issue they have. Um, they don't use their tight ends enough. Uh, mm -hmm. If you look at the, look at the, the yards per target and yards per uh, catch that they're getting from, um, uh, Oh my gosh, I can see him in my mind. Um, from Virginia Tech, was a quarterback in college. Um, Logan, hmm. Logan Thomas. Logan, Logan Thomas is a very effective tight end. They don't throw the ball enough. And if they did that more and ran the ball more, that would make their play action game also a little more effective. And then they should use their 12 personnel more, put Bates and Thomas on the field more. So Bates, Thomas, and then they're, they only have two really effective wide receivers. They should just keep it to those two. 
uh, Jahan Dotson and, and Terry McLaurin. And we, once again, when they get the running game going, it takes a while sometimes to get it going. But when they get it going, I mean, Brian Robinson is really a talented running back. And, you know, can, when combined with Antonio Gibson, who they sometimes seem to forget they have, um, if they were to use those, I mean, I, I'm only half joking when I say that, Zenny, but his his usage has gone down to such an extent that I, I don't get it. Like, he's really talented. He catches the ball well. He's fast. He's big. I mean, that guy would be absolutely dominant in somebody else's offense where they knew how to use him. But uh, they need to rediscover their 12 and 21 personnel packages and just – you know, take some of the pressure off that offensive line because Sam Howell's getting beaten to death. I yeah. think yeah, he is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And but that's some part of the decisions he makes though. Well, that's part of the beating to death part, right? So my you know what you're saying he's so tired of getting beaten to death, he's just kind of throwing it up for whoever catches it. Here's what I'm explaining. What we call shaking quarterback syndrome, right? When you get hit often enough, even when you aren't getting hit, your 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 process is still sped up. And that's why you want to pressure on quarterbacks, right? Not the just the, you get hit so much you think you're gonna get hit again and again and again, even when you don't you get start hit. you start looking for it, right? Now you're it's looking at, and you're Ghosts. looking at the and your your eyes are coming down to, to check the pass rush and things like that. And then you're when you scared. pick your, yeah, and then when it. you pick it when you pick your eyes back up, what you thought was there isn't there anymore. So Ghosts. yeah. So mm -hmm. you have so you have and once again he's a talented young quarterback, and I think he could be the guy, but they've got to one protect him better to get back to running the football. Like he's getting, they're throwing the ball too much. He's getting hit so much. If they were to bring his attempts down by say five to seven fewer attempts, mm -hmm. he would get hit less. He would not feel so much pressure to carry the team. And <clears throat> they would take some of the pressure off their defense. Yeah. Because they have a lot of three and outs, a lot of very quick, <clears throat> very quick possessions. There you go. Well, folks, uh, it is now <coughs> 12 a.m., uh, 12, 12, and uh, we're at that point where Mr. Carroll needs cough medicine. <laughs> All right. Vinny, take us out. Okay, guys. Uh, tomorrow is going to be the Super Bowl uh, rematch, and you know Thanksgiving is right around the corner so everyone please go to the store if you possibly can stock up on all the food you need and the way and it also if you want to make it super special for football what i would recommend is having food that is catered to those teams so packers lines e-a-e-e-a-g-l-e-s eagles sorry well eagles are not Eagles are not Eagles are not playing on Thanksgiving, but they are playing tomorrow. Right, that's why I said E A G L E S Eagles. I have them winning too. Also, I think the Eagles are. I, I said it. if it was a rematch, I think the Eagles would win in the Super Bowl. And I think that on if Taylor Swift cries if they get blown out. I'm just well, I'm just I don't think they'll get blown I don't, out. I don't, I don't know about blown out. Um, and no, I don't that's know. the question though. Is there a can you bet on that? Is she gonna say whale? I'm not sure if you can. Oh, 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 are you looking? Are you, are you 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 mean looking for a prop bet? Is there a Taylor? Well, yeah, I want to know. Bet? I want to know if they can bet that she wails and cries. You think it blown out? Let's say it blown out by thirty I points. Mean, it might be I mean, just just look it up. I mean, it, I'm DraftKings or whatever. Somebody will show you all the all the prop bets that are available for that game. And but how, what if there's not? Maybe we can. Hey, cha ching. Uh -huh. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> On it. Okay. Uh, capital idea, Mister Carroll. Glad you thought of it. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, absolutely wonderful. We could still how you can see how excited Bill is by the expression. There, <laughs> there are there are Taylor Swift bets, um, and I'll tell you what they are. You're not um, what I'm talking about, though. But go ahead. So, um, there's one that let me see. So, Travis Kelsey to not score a television, a uh, television a touchdown. Score a television. Um, <laughs> There's one Travis Kelsey have the most receiving guards in the game. Well, that's an easy one. Uh, let's see. There is a running away together. Uh, let's see. Running away together. <laughs> uh, let's see. Da, 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 by nine and a half. When he was when he got her in his car. Ah. 
Jeez, uh, <laughs> man. <laughs> hey, what about you watching out there? You, 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 only one watching us right now. What do you think? Would you bet that Taylor Swift cries if the Chiefs get blown out by over, by at or over, say twenty points? Yeah, I think she would. I think she would cry if that were to happen. But you take that bet, huh? Okay. Oh yeah, I would. If that were to happen, I would. Hmm. What say you, Bill? Um, I don't know if she cries. She's got a lot going on in her life. Um, she's got other things on her mind. Um, there's a prop bet about if the term swelsy um, starts swelsy. to <laughs> starts to gain momentum. Uh, well, how do you how do you determine that? Google Trends. <laughs> I, I, I that's a great question. Um, let me see. Will she wear his jersey at the next game? There's a prop bet about that. Will they still be a couple by Valentine's Day? Is a prop bet. <laughs> there's um, there's a there's a prop bet about they'll still be together by the time the Super Bowl rolls around. There's a prop bet God. about if they be a couple if they'll still be a couple by the first uh, game of next season. Mm. Uh, see also here's so I, will it, so how, here's what it is so if it will be the number one possible couple name along with tay trey <laughs> trift <laughs> trift trey Trift. tracy i guess tracy who, who I guess. With tay tra um, travis oh swift tra swiftus uh <laughs> swivis and take take takele yeah. How about, how, about, are, how about spare me this? How about yeah. that? Um, These names bet, are terrible. Bet, BetUSA.com has a prop bet for what type of facial hair will Travis Kelsey display the next game? Um, I guess if like, you bring blonde? Him, no, 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 no. If he, uh, facial hair. So Van Dyke, soul oh. patch, connected, you know, beard and soul patch. Like, yeah, there's, there's some there's some uh, prop bets there also regarding his uh, – yeah. So there's a few different uh, prop bets available. Oh, will she appear on the um, podcast, New Heights? There's a prop bet for that. Uh, uh, all there's, kind, a, there's, all some o there's some over-unders for just how many um, uh, Chiefs games you'll see also. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Too – I mean, too much. You know, a lot. <laughs> just um, overall, just too much. Wow. Mm -hmm. Too much. All right. Oops. Well, I think on that note, we have yes. had a great conversation. Oh, yes. Absolutely, I'd say so. We will be back what time is best tomorrow? Mm, I'd say like seven's good. Does that work for you, Bill? Yeah, seven, he, even a little, even a little earlier. Yeah, seven or even a little, little earlier could work for me, yes. Vinny, can you go earlier or is that? I can do six. Six Eastern is five your time, Bill. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, is that okay? Yeah, I'm probably. I, 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 didn't, I didn't know about I was thinking like maybe 15, 20 minutes earlier, but yeah, sure, whatever. <laughs> All right, so basically six, 6 p.m., EST November twenty first, which uh yeah, which is the day that Oppenheimer comes out. On physical media, right? Uh yeah, uh-huh. Yeah. Got it. All right, folks. Thank you for a rousing show. Hey, we'll see you uh on Monday. We have tomorrow too. Just before Monday night, right? Yeah. Yeah. So then we can uh, figure out. Maybe we'll come up with some more crazy Taylor Swift bets that no one else has thought of. There you <laughs> go. There you yeah. go. Yeah. I don't see why not. Maybe I'll. Maybe I'll hey. Hmm? I have one. A bet that Taylor Swift gets sponsored by Zen Optical. <laughs> no, <laughs> just, no, no, just that's not <laughs> Or maybe one about maybe national anthem at the Super Bowl. I mean, there's a lot of things you could toss up. There. I think it's more likely we should do a halftime show than just the national anthem. Well, yeah. not this year. It would happen the following year. I just want a goose zinny optical. That's all I'm after. Yeah. 
<laughs> All right. Stick around in the background, everybody. We'll see you folks tomorrow. Uh, Pre-Monday Night Football. Be okay. there. Be square. See you guys.